It's lucky episode number 21. We're going to pull these carburetors off in record time. Welcome to Hack a Week. Okay, this is number four. Uh, the fourth time taking off these carburetors. It's 3.29 right now. At 3.30 I'm going to start and see just how fast I can pull these carburetors off. Like I said, it's the fourth time. I know just what tools I need. Everything I need is right here in my hands to take these carbs off this bike completely. So uh, we're just going to wait for the clock to hit 3.30, which should happen pretty soon and uh, we'll get everything off. Again, what we're after on these is to go ahead and pull off the covers on the top where the diaphragm is that pulls up the needle and check the passageway that runs down into the cylinder bore. I've got a feeling it's plugged up. I've got some tiny drills. I'm going to drill it out to probably uh, 0.4 millimeter and see what it does then. That should maybe do the trick. I'll get into the mains. I don't think it's clogged up tank or anything like that. There we go. It's 3.30. Here we go. Eight minutes. Carbs out in eight minutes. <laughs> I love it. Last time it took me uh, maybe 15. The first time it took me, I don't know, a freaking hour. Of course, I hadn't been in there before, so I didn't know what I was after. But anyway, there they are. They're out. Let's get them over on the bench now, see what we can do about opening up those passageways. Okay, we've been here before. Let's pull the covers off the diaphragms so we can get in there and open up that hole. Right there, that's the passageway I'm talking about. That thing is so tiny right now, it's, uh, I can't even get like a really, really thin wire through it, and I think it just needs to be opened up to the bore that you see right there on the top. So I'm gonna run a 0.4 millimeter drill through there. We're gonna put everything back together, stick it back in the bike, and see what happens. I've got the drill chucked up in uh, my portable Dremel. I'm not going to use it under power because it would just snap that drill bit. I'm just going to turn it by hand and use this as a holder. Valve covers are off. <clears throat> not that hard to do in my situation because I've got a lot of the stuff pulled off from the bike already so it makes the job pretty easy to do. But Pretty much you get the tank off, the side covers off, you pull out that heat shield that's right here, and then you can take off the, uh, the back cover, and the back one is in two parts. That enables you to get it out of the frame. The front one is not in two parts, the front one is just a one piece, like so. So anyway, here's the tappets. They're basically like this. There's four valves per cylinder, two intake, two exhaust. And the tappet sits like this and it pivots back here and the cam pushes on it as it comes around and it pushes on the two valves. So you need to adjust the two tappets, the clearance between the tappet and the valve stem. And uh, six thousandths is pretty much what it's turned out to be is the best way to do it just in your own garage without the special tool that Honda made that actually pulls the cam up into a position that they say simulates real running and then you do it at four thousandths but usually with valves a little loose is better than too tight too tight and the valve doesn't close all the way that's not good 
So the reason I'm doing this is just to eliminate this as any kind of a possibility adding to the problems I'm having. I really don't think it's at the heart of the problem, but what the hell? I never have adjusted the valves on this. I don't know anything about what condition they're in. It was a good thing to do. So here we are inside here. The cams look great, that's the good news, and uh, there is a little bit of play in every one of them. I checked them all real quick, but I'm gonna stick a 6 thousandths feeler gauge in there and check them. Uh, you do that with a feeler gauge under each one. You can't just do one and then the other because there's a chance you may have it off a little bit. So you stick a 6 thousandths under one and the other and you adjust them both and tighten them down. More information on that, you can get a Haynes manual or a climber manual and you'll get a much more detailed uh, description of just what to do with some pictures and all that stuff. But pretty much that's what I'm gonna do next here. I'll get a couple close-ups of while I'm doing it. You can just kind of get the idea where to stick the feeler gauge, but I'm not gonna focus too much of the video time on that. I'm just gonna get this done and move along. The way I turn over the engine is I pull the spark plugs out put it in gear, I put it in sixth gear. That way I can turn the back wheel and I can actually rotate the engine. You'll see the engine parts move right here. As I, oops, I've got it in neutral right now. Let me kick it into uh, sixth gear real quick. And you have to rotate the transmission a bit as you shift the motorcycle. So let me move the wheel and you'll see that Maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. Basically, I'm able to rotate the motor like that. You can also use the starter. Just turn off the ignition, and you can use the starter to uh, bump it, but it needs to be a neutral to do that. So see, you can just bump it simple like that. What you want to do is get it on the back side of the camshaft when you adjust it. So the cam has a lobe that it's kind of shaped like this. This is the high side of the lobe. You want it to be other way around so that the tappet is on the back side of the cam, the side that's not lifting it up. That's where you want to do your adjustment or at top dead center. I usually just do it per valve, rotate it around to the back of the cam lobe and then do the adjustment. Okay, enough of this long-winded description. Let's just get it done. These are 10 millimeter nuts. You loosen those up first, and then take a long flat blade screwdriver, and you can come in through the top of the frame. Make sure that these are all loose. Back them off just a little bit. Now what you need to do is get that 6 thousandths feeler gauge in. And what I've done is I basically sacrificed one. I bought a, a $7 feeler gauge set. I pulled out the 6 thousandth feeler gauge, which is 0 .006 by the way, and then the other measurement is 0.152 millimeters, and I bent it so that I can drop it down in there and stick it under both of them at the same time. So let's see if I can squeak that in there with the help of uh, a needle nose pliers. My fingers are going to be in the way for a minute. You won't be able to really see what's going on until I get it all in there, but you basically want to get it in between the valve stem the head and the tappet. You might have to back off the screws quite a bit to do that. That's fine because you can adjust them all up later. Let's get that tucked in. Okay, there we go. I've got the uh, the feeler gauge is sitting in there. You can see that now. It's it's underneath the tappet and on top of the valve stem. When you're doing all this stuff, by the way, be really careful you don't drop anything down into the engine because it can go down into the engine through the uh, the uh, timing chain hole. So let's keep that in place and we'll take the screws and just barely snug them and make sure that they aren't bottoming out on the nut but they're actually bottoming out on the feeler gauge. Really light touch on this. You don't want to squeeze, you know, don't turn a whole lot and make it tight. Just where it just bumps. Okay, now here's the tricky part. Now that you've got it all set, you need to tighten those two nuts. But you also need to hold the screw right in that position where it is now. This is the tricky part now. That that screw can't rotate at all. If I if I tighten it and do that as I tighten, that's not good. That's going to be a tight valve. So again, just to where it just 
stops turning. You can just feel a little tension on it and hold that screw right there and give it a good snug. And let's go over to the other one. Get it on the nut first. Do a little adjustment, just bump it against there. Hold it good and steady, don't let it turn. And give that nut a good snug. You don't have to get these screaming tight, just uh, a good firm torque. That's all you need. Okay, now if we got that okay and not too tight, I should be able to just slide that feeler gauge right out of there. And indeed, it does come right out. So that's good. Hear that little bit of tick, tick, tick? That's a six thousandth clearance and that's what we want. Now I've got to repeat that on all of the cylinders. So that wasn't bad. It was about 20 minutes to get those all uh, adjusted. When you put these bolts back in, they have a uh, six millimeter Allen head on them. Be careful. They're really easy to get uh, too tight and break. So just a good snug. Just, ah, uh, that's it. That's all you need. Don't be tempted to go really tight thinking you're going to make them seal better. They're going to seal just fine. Don't go too tight. You will break one and you'll be sorry. They're a bitch to get back out. The carbs are back on. Time for another test ride. Cross your fingers. say is I think I've pretty much ruled out the carburetors after pulling them off five times. I know the float settings okay. I know they're getting fuel in there. I've looked at it when I read it through the air cleaner and I can see the needles lifting up. It's opening up. It's got to be something ignition related which is really freaking odd but I suppose it could happen. <sighs> this is really testing my patience at troubleshooting this one. But of course, that's what it's going to be because it's all just good fodder for video for you guys, right? Yay. Oh well, anyway. Onward we go. Next up, we're going to start troubleshooting ignition. Damn. Hey, you know what? I might have it figured out. I just did a little test with the timing light and, uh, well, let me just show you what the results were. All right, I'm hooking up the timing light to the front two cylinders. They fire off the same coil at the same time. I'm just gonna shine the light, the strobe, right here in this area. You'll see it flash. Watch what happens when it hits five and a half thousand RPMs.
Yeah, so what the hell happened to the spark there? Huh? Yeah, it cut out. The back cylinders, don't do that. I got a feeling it might be that long run of uh, spark plug wires that I did. Remember I, I mounted that uh, coil way back? Mm -hmm. I got a feeling that coil's not built to carry spark or those spark plug wires aren't built to carry spark that far. So time to relocate that coil back up to the front again. Got a little thought here before I do that relocation of that coil. Um, you know, a coil should be able to carry spark over a distance like that. It does it on cars, it does it on other motorcycles just fine. So the other place I want to check is the, uh, the two ignition igniters, the CDI units. They are right here. And as it turns out, the, uh, the one that's the bigger of the two is a rev limiter. Pretty sure that's the one that's going to the coils that are at the front that I'm having the problems with. This one doesn't have a rev limiter. You can see the extra circuitry built onto this one up here uh, with a rev limiter in it. And I'm pretty good at hacking electronics, but the thing about just taking out all of that rev limiting circuitry is that's fine. But the numbers on these modules here, these are shielded from electronic noise. Uh, there's two different numbers going on, 6D08 and 6D12. So probably internal here, there's some differences going on. So probably can't just hack this one. So what I'm going to do, I think, is uh, jump on eBay. I've already found a few of them and buy another one just like this. In other words, replace the one with the rev limiter with one without the rev limiter and see what that does. Saturday morning and the CDI unit for the bike still hasn't arrived. It's on the way and the tracking shows it's in the town nearby. It might make it today, we'll see. But what did arrive is the shock that I ordered about uh, three, four days ago. This is a shock from a 1995 CBR 600 and it's going to get mounted in the place of that crazy old air shock. This is about uh, 12 inches long between the two eyes and the one that's on the bike stock is about 18 inches from this eye to the one down there. So what I'll have to do is make an extension for it. Um, you know, it'll, it'll go in there and that bottom part will have to be extended. There is a guy on the internet that does that. He will uh, rebuild the shock and make the extension all for like about 250 bucks. But I took a look at the way that it's done and I can do it myself with the machine equipment I have at work. And all it's gonna involve is just basically two pieces that come down on either side here and they'll lock into this section here by notching this out and then creating a another notch on the, uh, what do you think Seamus, is that gonna work? Okay, Seamus says that'll work and uh, Anyway, it'll go in there and it'll lock it in place and keep it from pivoting. It'll all make sense when it happens later on. But uh, as soon as we get that part here, um, maybe we can see if that solves the, uh, the issue of this thing cutting out at 5,500 RPMs. Hope so. Ha ha! Look what the mail brought today. All the way from Arizona. Ah, uh, my favorite. Cheetos without the flavoring. No, that's not what it is. Um, hang on. It is. Ta-da! A CDI unit. With the... Cool, there it is. This one still has the plug on. And if you remember from several episodes ago, I took the plug off from mine to make a little more space, make it easier to tuck in. So this won't be a plug and play device. This will be a solder it in and play device. So let's go ahead and get this sucker soldered up and go for a ride. So the CDI is mounted up, 
You probably noticed that I put the one in that has the rev limiter. Uh, it turned out to be just a pretty good deal, and I figured, well, I'd just stick with what was stock. It's good to have the rev limiter on there anyway. Hopefully this one works okay. We'll find out soon on a test drive. I've got the GoPro mounted up, and uh, I came up with a, a way to mount that and stiffen up the mount for the fairing. Let's take a look at that real quick. I put a piece of aluminum between uh, where I mounted the instrument cluster to the uh, headlight bucket up to the dashboard area. That's for lack of anything better to call that. And uh, it really stiffened up the mount for the uh, fairing quite a bit. Plus I got a cool GoPro mount um, that'll face forward or back. So that's that. Time for the test drive, moment of truth. Oh well, that didn't do it. Uh, as you saw in that little test drive, it hit 5,500 RPMs again and just flat didn't want to go any further. So it's probably still the same issue, uh, but evidently not caused by the CDI. A um, couple ways I can troubleshoot that. I suppose I could switch CDI boxes on the wiring harness and then do a test with the test uh, light, you know, the uh, timing light on the rear two cylinders and see if they cut out or not. If they don't cut out and it, you know, it does fine and doesn't cut out, but it cuts out on the front ones, then it could be a coil. An easier way would be just to switch the coils front to rear, do a test on the rear then, and if I see the cutout happening on the rear with a known good CDI unit, then I probably have a bad coil. That could very likely be. They do read a little different in ohms, who knows. Electrical gremlins can drive you crazy, but you got to keep after them and eventually you will figure out what's wrong. So we're going to wrap it up for now and I'm going to continue to troubleshoot until I get this thing running right and I will make it happen. So anyway, till next time. Well, it's Saturday morning and the uh, part, the ignition igniter thing, CDI, yeah, blur.